believe it's time to go right into the Word. I'm so glad today to have Ruben Alejandro Ramos on our staff. Just a real man of God who loves the Lord, loves you as well. I've asked him to bring to us Hebrews you, chapter 9 today. Would, I know you love him. Would you just give him a warm welcome today? God bless you. Love you. Thank you, Jesus. Here we go. Am I on here? I can't hear me. There we go. Perfect. How's it going, everybody? Doing all right? I like what God's doing here today. Amen? Hey, listen, let's do this. Let me just give you two things right off the top here. I want to let you know that we're in the middle of a series called Jesus is Better. If you have not listened to any of the other messages in this series, you're going to want to uh, listen to those just truly because um, God is doing something incredible through this. And I want you to be able to experience all of that. And so if you want to take the time, uh, maybe while you are driving to work, you can be able to listen to it on our app or listen to it on YouTube, whatever is easier for you, and be able to check all of those things out. That'll be amazing. Um, am I cutting in and out? Or is that me? Okay, perfect. Can I get your handheld? And I'll just do it from there. I wasn't sure if it was me going crazy, which is very likely, or this here. I don't know. You're such a hero. Look at that. Doesn't he look great in this color? Yeah. I'm going to try this again, Yaz. Is this good? Okay. It was me. It was me the whole time. You're a hero. So we're going through this amazing message series. I want you to check all of that out. So feel free to go on our app, on our website, on YouTube, whatever it is, and be able to look that up to be able to, to continue to learn what it looks like for us to recognize that Jesus is better. In today's message series, what we are going to be talking about, I'll give you the title of the message right up front, it is Holy Healed. Because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, we are wholly healed. Here is my sermon in a sentence, my message in a moment. If you forget everything that I say today, but you remember this right here, you're going to be in good shape. And that is this, because of Jesus' finished work, we are healed holistically. Now, the word holistically might feel weird for some of you, so I'm going to take the weird out of it real quick. What I'm talking about that is that because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, we are healed physically. We are here healed spiritually, and we are healed emotionally and mentally. Jesus' work does not stop at just a healing that brings us to the place where we can enter into the throne room of God, but continues to heal the whole person. That's what I mean. That's what we mean today when we're saying that Jesus heals holistically. So here's my question for you. Has anybody ever had their hands kind of caught in the cookie jar before? This can be a literal cookie jar. Maybe you walk down, it was 11 o'clock at night and everyone's going to bed and all of a sudden there's some head nods going on. I like it. All of a sudden we have this moment where you're shoving ice cream in your face when you weren't supposed to and then you get caught, right? It might be um, the, the, a literal cookie jar. It might be a metaphorical cookie jar. I'll tell you this right now. Um, I absolutely love Oreos. Anybody else? That is a gift from God. You want to talk about what the manna of heaven was? I guarantee you it was a double stuff Oreo. I can guarantee it. Check the Hebrew. It says double stuff Oreo. It even's missing the second F. I'm telling you. I promise. I'm going to give you a side note here. Here's the thing that I, that's really important. I want you to know how much I care about Oreos. This is pathetic of me, and I'm going to continue anyway because I have the mic and you can't stop me. When it comes to Oreos, regular stuff Oreos are never enough. And I don't know why we as a society pretend that Nabisco can get away with us. Regular stuff Oreos, not enough cream, not enough stuff in the middle. I think that we should petition that there is the standard for a regular Oreo is double stuff. We start with double stuff and then we proportionally go from there, okay? <laughs> I will also give you another side note about this double stuff Oreo, because in case you thought that you were actually getting double the stuff, you're not, they're lying to you. 
there was a mathematician who did this thing where he tried to weigh all of the Oreos from a regular Oreo and a double stuff Oreo to know how much of the double stuff we're actually getting. Do you know you and I are being cheated? Do you know in a double stuff Oreo, there's only 1.86 times the amount of cream than there is in a regular stuff Oreo? It is a lie by Big, Big Nabisco, and I am here to tell you that I'm calling it out. You can't have this anymore. I'm telling you, Nabisco, we're on to you. This is a Nabisco factory where I grew up in North Jersey, and you would drive by in order to get to a mall, and the whiff of Oreo that you would get while you drove by that, oh, it was amazing. So anyway, all of that to say, <laughs> I really love Oreos. I'll do this thing my wife makes fun of me all the time because I treat Oreos like popcorn. It's not like, oh, let's just have one or two. It's like, I'm going to continue to pop these into my mouth over and over and over again because I love Oreos so much. Sometimes Pastor Russ talks about his love for Oreo and he was like, yeah, you sit there and eat a whole sleeve. And I'm like, a whole sleeve? That's an appetizer, baby. <laughs> you just keep going and going. Oreos tells you when you stop eating Oreos. You don't tell them. So I'll do this thing when we have Oreos in the house and I'll just eat them and I'll sneak them every once in a while. We have a little child lock on the cabinet for theoretically my daughter, but it's actually for me. And we have this lock that's in there and uh, I'm getting really mad at the lock because now it's getting a little old and like squeaky. So I'll open it and I'll be like, Aah! so everyone knows in the house that I'm going and eating these Oreos. So what ends up happening is I pop one, two, three, four, five, half the thing is gone, right? And then my wife wants one later on. She goes, where did all the Oreos go? And I was like, it was our daughter. I saw her sneaking in there and I said, Lena, stop. You can't be doing this, right? I'm not holding on to that guilt. That's what, she can have it, that's fine. <laughs> There's one time when my uh, daughter woke me up. She said, I'm hungry, can we go downstairs? and have breakfast. And I said, yeah, sure. So we're, we're going downstairs. I said, hey, let me run to the bathroom first and then I'll go and I'll get you some breakfast. So I go to the bathroom, I come back out. And the second that I come back out, she does one of these things. <laughs> she's hiding something. I'm not sure what it is, but she's hiding something behind her back. And I go, Adelina, what's that behind your back? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> There's nothing at all behind your back? No. Why are you hiding it from me then? It's nothing. I said, can you show me what it is? They're muffins. Muffins is what we normally feed her in the morning. We have little packets of muffins, right? I go, if they're muffins, why don't you just show me what they are? I go, no, they're muffins. Baby, just show me that, right? She eventually moves her hands and there's two pieces of candy that are in her hands that she got off of the counter from the night before. And I said, that's not exactly the truth here, right? She gives them over and then we go and we have breakfast and everything's fine, right? She's in the place where she feels a little bit guilty, but she can move on and, and we're going from there. And I think for you and I, what we can often do is that we have certain things that we're willing to share with other people because they're silly or they're quirky or they uh, are these weird humble brags, right? We have these things that when we're meeting with other people in our small groups and our life groups or with friends, um, we have this like humble brag that we do or like, I know, I know that I work too much. I just care too much about my job, right? And we know that it's not actually good that we're working 60 plus hours a week, but we feel good about it. So it's this humble brag that we do. Or there's other things that we feel a little bit more comfortable confessing that might not look the best. So in a small group around other people, we might be like, oh yeah, um, you know, I raised my voice and my kids a little bit, right? Again, something we can feel a little bit comfortable about going into. And then things like, oh, well, I cheated on my diet when we went to get ice cream. I should have gotten sugar-free frozen yogurt, but instead I got my, my regular ice cream. Again, things that we can feel good that we know we shouldn't be doing, but in the grand scheme of things, don't really feel that big of a deal. It's uh, at least alleviating us a little bit of this guilt that we feel inside. And what I wanna talk about is when we're talking today about how the finished work of Jesus Christ heals us holistically, I need us to understand what we're talking about. Because God not only heals you of the sin that you have in your life, but he also heals you of the guilt and shame of the sin that was associated with that sin. 
And I think it's really important for us to recognize that there is a grandiose difference between guilt and shame. There's a huge difference between guilt and shame. And sometimes we use those things interchangeably, but psychologically speaking, and even definitions that we can, ideas that we can pull from scripture, guilt and shame are not the same thing. When we're talking about guilt, it is oftentimes that guilt, we say something along the lines of, I feel bad for what I have done. Guilt is, I feel bad for what I have done. While shame is saying, other people make me feel bad for what I've done. Okay? Guilt is this internal, shame is external. I feel bad for what I've done versus other people or the enemy, the devil, makes me feel bad for what I have done. And to illustrate this for us to be able to kind of know what this looks like, say that somebody is caught embezzling money to the IRS and they have to pay a $50,000 fine and they have to go to prison for two years. If the person pays the fine, if they serve the sentence, they are legally relieved legal of their legal guilt in that scenario. That would be gone. But walking back into church, walking back into the situations where people know what you've done, you might still feel shame. Other people are putting that on you. So again, if Jesus is to heal holistically, what do we do with that guilt and shame? How do we move on for those things? I want us to be able to look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 through 10. But before we dive into that, I want to give you a little bit of context that happens in the verses beforehand. For us to recognize what this looks like, the author of Hebrews is going through this, and he is telling us this is the duties of the high priest. He walks us through. This is what happens when the high priest is going through and kind of getting prepared for the Day of Atonement, getting prepared to make the sacrifice for the people. What ends up happening is that when there is sin that happens in Israel or when there's sin that happens for a person, there is a sacrifice that has to be made. So oftentimes the high priest making that sacrifice, it would be happening on behalf of the Jewish people. If you ever heard about the celebration of Yom Kippur, that's the Day of Atonement, and this is what they're talking about. In that moment, the high priest needs to make a large sacrifice for the sins of the people. And the high priest would do this thing Traditionally speaking, the high priest would do this thing where in order to make sure that he can properly make that sacrifice, he's doing all this cleansing for himself as well. He's going through and making sure that he is right with God before he even enters in to doing anything on behalf of the people of Israel. So he actually separates himself. He separates himself and makes sure that he is not in the place where he can sin against other people. He ends up praying and cleansing and doing these things over and over and over and over again in order to make sure that he is good before entering into the Holy of Holy Places, entering into the Most High Place, so that he can make the sacrifice on behalf of the nation of Israel. Okay? So that is what the author of Hebrews is saying before we get into this verse right here in verse 6. It says this, it says, when these things are all in place, all the preparation, all the cleansing, all that, those things, the priest regularly enters the first room as they perform the religious duties. But only the high priest ever enters into the most holy place and only once a year. And he always offers blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people that were committed in ignorance. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit rele- revealed that the entrance to the most holy was not freely opened as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented was still in use. I want you to remember that idea, the system that was still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offered are not able to cleanse the consciousnesses of the people who bring them. For the old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, external regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. See, I want us to look at this idea. Often going through the book of Hebrews, even when I started coming to faith for the first time and, and kind of trying to understand these concepts, going through the book of Hebrews, I was always in the place where I was like, I am not smart enough for this book. 
I don't know if you feel that in this message series, and I think Pastor Russ and Pastor Matt have done a brilliant job of breaking all of this down. I'm very grateful for what they're talking about. But oftentimes when I'm going through this, I go, I'm not smart enough to understand what this, what this book is saying, right? There's, there's this idea, okay, like these are these bigger concepts. There's tying in all these things from the Old Testament and all these things are these beautiful explanations of what Jesus has done for us. And sometimes I'm just like, I, I just don't get it. It's just not clicking for me. Like I get it, but I don't get it. You know what I mean? I don't know if that's anybody else. Okay, thank you. Just somebody please save me so I don't feel, thank you so much. So in trying to conceptualize what this actually looks like, this is how I have kind of come to the place where I recognize what's going on, right? So the author is talking about all of these ex external regulations that happen, these old systems that happen in order for us to be able to understand that this was a system that was in place in order for us to relieve ourselves from our sins and being in, in, the, in a good standing relationship with Jesus Christ while simultaneously being in the place where we shouldn't feel guilty about these things because we have done all the proper protocol. But you and I still live in this place where we think a proper protocol has to happen for us to be relieved of this consciousness of the sin that we committed. And this might be because of religious guilt that we have from previous faiths that we have held. This might be for other reasons. It might be from parents who have pushed this on us, that you have to redeem yourself in order to be standing in good graces once again. I'm not sure, but oftentimes we feel like we have to pay our own penance in order to be in a right relationship with God again. So we do this thing that when somebody sins, we say, oh, you know, people go, oh, I'll just do 10 Hail Marys and everything will be okay. When somebody messes up, let me give money over to the homeless shelter. Maybe let me volunteer when I'm in church. All of these are means of using external regulations, systems that make sense to us in order to try to relieve ourselves from the guilt and shame that is burdening us. But that is working within the old systems that exist. And I am here to tell you that Jesus' finished work heals us holistically. And so when he dies on the cross for our sins, he is not just dying on the cross for our sins, but as the scripture is saying, he is, he is removing the consciousness of that sin and that guilt from us as well. Amen. We no longer sit in those same places. But oftentimes what we end up doing is trying to place ourselves above God when it comes to our placement in him. He forgives us of our sin, but then we say, no, 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 I have to redeem myself. He forgives us of our sins, but I have to prove to him for some reason that I was worth saving. We do all these things which are external regulations in order for us to come back into this right standing with God as if he is not already saying, no, 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 my son has already done everything. We do these things and have these external regulations. We work within the system that makes sense to us, the system that we know, and it's like us spraying cologne all over ourselves as if we don't stink. Have you been around a 14-year-old boy who is playing outside all day and gets this cheapo body spray that he picked up at the dollar store and you're like, my guy, you smell awful, go and take a shower. But you and I do the same thing all the time with God. We go, look, God, I gave 11% today for my tithes and offerings. You are more than welcome to do that. I will bless you, right? But I'm here to tell you that doesn't change our standing in God. Volunteer all day long. I hope you do because that is us being able to say that I want to serve the kingdom of God. But if we're doing it out of motivation to go, God, I am worth redeeming. Please, I'm sorry. Save me. We're doing it for the wrong motivation. We're doing it for the wrong reasons. Help out, volunteer, give, do all of those things. But if we are in the place where we're doing them because we're saying, God, it doesn't matter that you accept me. I say that I'm unacceptable. We're doing it for the wrong reasons. There's a psychologist by the name of M. Basil Pennington. He says this, he said, if God accepts you as a sinner, how could you do less? Why would you try to redeem yourself when free redemption has already been offered to you? Praise God. Amen. 
You may be thinking, where, where does this all tie in? Hebrews 9, verses 12 to 14, it says this. It says, with his own blood, Jesus' own blood, not the blood of goats and of calves, he entered into the most holy places once and for all and secured your redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of heifers could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurities. But just think of how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciousnesses from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. What the scripture is saying is that not only is the finished work Jesus, of Jesus Christ forgiving me of my sin, but it's also forgiving me of the consciousness of the guilt and shame that I feel about my sin. That's right. That's right. So I am no longer in the place where I have to re-qualify myself to be in the presence of God. Amen. Now, what I'm not saying is that when we sin, when we offend God or offend other people, that we are not to turn away from those things. What I'm not saying is that when we mess up, when we sin, we are not to repent and turn back to God. What I'm not saying is that we are in this place where we no longer have to work in order to, or participate, I should say, in the changing of who I am to reflect the kingdom of God. It is still vital that we participate in our own discipleship of growing and becoming more and more of the image of our Jesus. You participate in that. And when we participate in that, we have to recognize that it is vital for us to be in the process of saying, of recognizing the actions that I have done are not reflective of our Jesus. I'm making the gospel about something else. I'm making the gospel about the things that are the right political views. I'm making the gospel about what I believe about gun rights. I am making the gospel about what it looks like to be pro-life and truly pro-life. What I'm saying is that we can oftentimes place ourselves in a position where instead of recognizing that we are to repent of the sin that we have and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and the finished work that he's done, we say, oh, that's true and collectively as a church. This is not in my notes, and so, so sorry if this is going to hurt your feelings, except I'm not. Um, Paul, in another book, in Galatians, it's one of the first letters historically that he had wrote. When the Galatians were trying to say, oh, believe in Jesus and do all these other things, Paul says, oh, I wish that you would emasculate yourself for asking anybody to do those things. I'm not going to define that for you. Google it later. Paul is saying, why are you adding to people's salvation? Jesus has done the work. Why are you telling people that it is not just about believing in the finished work of Jesus, but also trying to do X, Y, Z in order to be in the right place? No, 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 no. Jesus Christ died on the cross so you and I can have redemption and be in the right place in righteousness under God. That's it. Our belief in him alone is all that is required. But we try to add all these things. Now, again, I'm in the place that I'm saying that if you believe in Jesus and you're actively involved in him, your life should reflect his more. So it is out of our love for God, out of our recognition of who he is, that then who we are internally changes. Otherwise, we are just continuing to create systems and con continuing to use external regulations in order to prove to other people, usually first, and then to God, hey, I was worth it. When Jesus said, that he rescued you because he delights in you. Not because you performed the best tests. Not because you gave the most to the church. Not because you served the most amount of hours in kids ministry. 
not because of the amount of hours that you spent setting up chairs. Solely and only because of your position that Jesus has offered you. So we come to this place where it is part of us and our understanding of scripture, understanding of Jesus, that we are to look more like him being merciful and meek as he was. And out of that, I turn away from my sin and I follow the things that God has offered me. But when I recognize that Jesus Christ has not only died for my sin, but he has died for the, sh the shame and the guilt that I feel over my sin, the consciousness of sin as the scripture lays it out. What that does, it allows me to be free. And as the scripture says, it allows me to worship the living God. When I am free of these things, what's the point of being alleviated of the shame and this guilt? It's because recognizing the freedom that is offered me purifies our consciousness from the sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. Because there are times what we do is that we walk into, uh, into, into church and we feel so guilty and feel so shameful about what we did last night that we refuse to worship. We get to this place where because of what I thought about this morning, I don't want to raise my hands. We come to this place where I refuse to sin, sing because of how bitter and angry that I feel. But because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, the consciousness of that sin, not just the sin itself, is removed from us. And I want to add this. This is not necessarily in the scripture, but I want us to recognize this because I think it is vitally important. Guilt and shame can feel very similar. And something else that feels similar but is way different is something called conviction. Okay, so if guilt says I feel bad about what I've done and shame says other people make me feel bad about what I've done, conviction is the thing that's saying, no, 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 come back to your father. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It is saying, I know the thing that you did. Yeah. Still come back to me. When we are following Jesus Christ and we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us as this counselor who guides us and leads us, we can come to the place where not only can conviction stop us from doing things that we shouldn't be doing, things that are not representative of his kingdom, but conviction in and of itself, when we do mess up, can say, don't isolate, run to your father. It is our habit human nature when we're scared to run away. Watch any animal that you see get scared. It's going to coil. It's going to try to free itself. It's going to try to hide in a corner. That's our nature. But instead, what God does, what Jesus is offering, saying that when you come to the place where you mess up, run to your father instead. Scripture says that we can boldly enter the throne room of God, recognizing that even if we are in the place that we have sinned, we are covered by his grace. You and I are wholly healed. The system that Jesus has set up is better than trying to live these external regulations that demand that we act a certain way and still feel guilty and tired and shameful. But the finished work of Jesus alleviates us from doing that. There's a time where Adelina is playing in, in the living room or whatever, watching TV, whatever it's going on. And I hear something fall, but I don't think anything of it. And she comes running over to me and she goes, Dad, I spilled some juice. What did she do in that moment? She recognized that she can come to her father who will help her fix the situation. She was not fearful. She was not scared that I was going to yell or punish her or push her away. She knows I messed up. Something happens. 
and I know where to go to get it fixed. For you and I, this conviction that we have as believers of Jesus, we can be in this place. That instead of running away and isolating ourselves, we can come to the Father because not only will he forgive us of our sin, he will relieve us of the consciousness of sin and shame and guilt. Saying we are free from all of it. In Hebrews chapter nine, verses 27 and 28. Again, this is one of those things where I don't feel smart enough to completely understand this. But it says this, and just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ has offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all of those who eagerly wait for him. I get weird questions all the time, people trying to understand stuff when it comes to scripture. Normally, I say, I don't know, I'll talk to Pastor Matt, he's smarter than I am, right? People try to say like, okay, but if Jesus died 2000 years ago, how do I now in 2024 come to the place where my sins are forgiven? The best explanation that I can ever give to somebody is, is that if God is eternal, Jesus is God. When he died on the cross, even if it was 2000 years ago, his sacrifice is also eternal. His sacrifice also extends and transcends that time. That's the best thing that I can typically offer. But I say this, if we want to get to the place where we want to have these conversations and hyper-focus on specifics, I think we miss what God is trying to do in us. God is love. God recognized that you and I were broken. God was desperate to mend the relationship that you and I have with him and was willing to bankrupt heaven in order to make that happen. So what he did is that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins so that we can be healed holistically. Every part of us could be healed. And this is what this scripture is talking about. The book of Hebrews does an excellent job of recognizing and making these connections about what happened in the Old Testament to what's happening here in the new system, the new covenant, the new promise that God has made. And I think that's amazing. And we can spend hours, and it's amazing to be able to go over and be able to, to kind of really go through this scripture and chew on this and try to really try to understand what's going on. I think that's incredible. But I think it's really vital for us to recognize that God loved you, broken, messed up you. You who is trying to hide something from everybody else because you think that no one will accept you if you ever said those words out loud. God loved you and sent Jesus Christ to regain that relationship and say, not only are you free from the sin that kept you away from me, but the consciousness of that sin, the shame and the guilt that made you think that you have to work within a system in order to gain my approval, that's gone. So I'm gonna do this as we end. We're gonna take communion in just a moment. You can consider this the official end of my message. But I wanna do this before we take communion. Can you, um, if somebody in the house has not received communion when you walked in, there was tables walking in in the front. If you are missing communion, can you raise your hands? Because we have some hosts that are around that can be able to help you out. I see a couple people. Looks like we're okay. 
Pastor Matt, when you come back to your seat, there's somebody right behind you. I want us to be able to do this. Before we take communion, you might be in the place today where you are listening to this and trying to say, I'm not sure I have ever caught what was happening here. You might be in a place where you're like, this Jesus thing actually doesn't sound so bad. And if that's where you're at, I wanna be able to offer a moment for you to begin a relationship with Jesus. So in order to make you feel comfortable, because I know this is a lot of new stuff, this is what I want us to do. I want everybody in this house, regardless of who you are, if you think that your eyes need to be open, I promise you they don't. Everybody in this house, I want them to close their eyes. You might be thinking, I need to keep my eyes open because of X. No, you don't. The person with the baby, you can keep your eyes open to take care of your kid. You're the only exception, okay? <laughs> Everybody with your eyes closed and your head bow. If you wanna be able to know and start a new faith journey with this Jesus that we described today, I want you to be able to raise your hand right now, right in your seat. I want you to be able to raise your hands. And if you would do me a favor, just keep it up for a little bit. I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna to count to the amount of people that are here raising their hands. I see one, two, three, four, five, six. The light might is blinding me right now, seven I see. So I might not be able to see everybody else, but I want you to know eight. I want you to know that the reason why I'm saying the number out loud is because I want you to know that you are not alone. There are other people in this house that are in the same position as you, wanting to experience this Jesus. And I think that's beautiful. And in order to continue this idea of you not being alone, this is what I'm gonna ask this entire family at the Fountain of Life to be able to do. I wanna lead you in a prayer. And the prayer is simple for us to be able to say that I recognize that I have messed up that I am sinful and I not, not only want to be free of my sin, but free of the consciousness of my sin, the guilt and the shame that we talked about. I wanna be healed holistically. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer where we kind of summarize that. And what I want everybody in this house to do is to repeat that prayer with the people, the seven, eight people who raised their hands so that you recognize, the seven and eight of you recognize that God sees you. We are partnering with you and being able to say that we believe in the decision that you're making today. And so for the seven or eight people, I want us to simply do this. I'm gonna pray a prayer, just repeat after me. The whole church is going to pray with you on this, okay? So all together with everybody's heads bowed, everyone's eyes closed, I wanna be able to say this, repeat after me, say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for healing me holistically. Thank you for healing me from my sin, healing me of my guilt and my shame. I recognize that you are better. I turn away from my old ways and I am following after you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give a huge round of applause to all of our friends? So next, what I wanna be able to do here is I want us to be able to take this communion cup together. I wanna let you know that if you gave to your heart to Jesus for the first time today, as you prayed those prayers, the seven or eight of you, we're gonna have prayer partners at the end of the service who are gonna be available for you. We wanna be able to give you a book so that way you can continue to grow in your faith. That's what that's about. So we wanna be able to connect with you a little bit, be able to know how we can pray with you, but ultimately we wanna help you continue to grow in your faith. So at the end of the service, we're gonna have those prayer partners available for you for the seven or eight of you. If you'd like to come and meet with one of them, that'd be great.